the Trump administration reportedly fears that Kim Jong-un will now refuse to give up his nuclear weapons program. And as the president welcomed his South Korean counterpart to the White House this afternoon, he sounded more equivocal about whether it'll happen. We're moving along and we'll see what happens. Uh, there are certain conditions that we want and I think we'll get those conditions. And if we don't, we don't have the meeting. And frankly, it has a chance to be a great, great meeting for North Korea and a great meeting for the world. Uh, if it doesn't happen, uh, maybe it'll happen later. Maybe it'll happen at a different time. But we will see. Uh, but we are talking. Uh, the meeting is scheduled, as you know, on June 12th in Singapore. And uh, whether or not it happens, you'll be knowing pretty soon. But we're talking right now. Past U.S. presidents have tried and failed for decades to secure peace with North Korea, but now with Pyongyang's nuclear development underway for years, the stakes are especially high. The CBC's Lindsay Duncombe has the latest from Washington. Well, I think this was the strongest indication yet from the White House that this summit is in jeopardy. Not only did Donald Trump say it might happen, it might not happen, uh, he also suggested that maybe the timeline, the Singapore meeting in June 12th, would be something uh, that they would not be able to meet because of the uncertainty around uh, what North Korea is putting on the table in terms of denuclearization. This is a, a tough spot for Donald Trump. There have been reports that he is asking aides about whether or not he should back out. On the one hand, there is a chance at making history about being the only president who was able to solve uh, this problem, which has such a history, such a scope, such a magnitude. On the other hand, what Donald Trump doesn't want to do is appear to get played by Kim Jong-un on the world stage. So that possibility for achievement balanced against uh, potential embarrassment is one of the things Donald Trump is is dealing with. Also was speaking in the Oval Office, Andrew, he talked about why it would be good for Kim Jong-un to come to the table. What's at stake for that country, which of course is certainly living under tough U.S. sanctions as well as sanctions from much of the rest of the world. Here was Trump's message to the North Korean dictator. He will be happy. His country will be rich. His country will be hardworking and very prosperous. They're very great people. They're hardworking, great people. Look at what happened with South Korea. Don't forget, we helped South Korea. We have spent trillions of dollars, not billions, trillions of dollars over many, many years. Uh, same people, same people. So, uh, yeah, I think that uh, he will be extremely happy if something works out. So, uh, Lindsay, this is obviously crucial to South Korea. Where does President Moon fit into all of this? Well, he is really on a salvage mission here. Kim, the Moon is bringing uh, insight to Donald Trump because it wasn't long ago he met with Kim Jong Un in that unprecedented meeting, and so he will be able to say what Kim Jong Un's motivations might be. Uh, but of course, being in such close proximity to the threat posed by North Korea gives South Korea this inherent motive to want to get some kind of peace deal. And it was very apparent from what Moon said in the Oval Office there, the part of their strategy continues to be flattering the U.S. president and really making it look as though or appear as though Donald Trump really is holding all the cards here. Here's some of what Moon said through translation. He said, the person who is in charge is Donald Trump, saying that Trump is the reason for the dramatic positive change in this uh, crisis that has been seen recently. And he also went on to say there would be no positive events in history if we look at things and say they didn't work before, so they won't work again. So Moon very clearly trying to inject optimism into this process, which is in jeopardy at the moment. The CBC's Lindsay Duncombe in Washington. To help us decipher the mixed messages we're getting, let's go to Sung Yoon Lee. He is a professor of Korean studies at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. He has also served as an expert witness on North Korea policy before the U.S. House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Professor Lee, thank you for taking the time. He's in Burlington, Massachusetts. So what do you make of the uh, perceived mixed messages being sent by the North Koreans? I think North Korea is playing its old game of playing hard to get. 
North Korea has shown that it is willing to walk away from meetings right in the middle of the meetings as well as from scheduled meetings. It's very much in their playbook. So North Korea on the eve of the summit meeting between Kim and Trump is trying to paint the U.S. into a corner, get the U.S. to make more concessions and to back off a little bit and to get the U.S. to be more prone to relieving North Korea of sanctions enforcement. And I think President Trump struck the right pose, right tone today to show some self-restraint and not come across as overly zealous, so eager for that summit meeting to take effect. I think that's the right approach. Do you think the North Korean tactics, if you want to call them that, or this game, as you say, is it going to work? It's always worked. This is really Rambo 4 rather than the very first Rambo install installment. We've seen this movie many times before. North Korea, after a period of relentless provocation, all of a sudden dramatically changes the tune from molto agitato to placido, flashes a few smiles and says, let's all meet, let's talk this over. And the, the leaders of the biggest powers in the world all oblige. Putin met with his father in 2000 and 2001. Kim Jong-il sent a special envoy to Clinton White House and invited Clinton to come to North Korea. That was the first ever inter-Korean summit, meetings with the Japanese prime minister, the Chinese leader, all back in 2000 and early 2000s. And that's what we're witnessing today. Kim Jong-un has gone from a reviled international pariah just in a few months from a maniac, madman, rocket man on a suicide mission to a legitimate global statesman. So the one sticking point seems to be the disagreement over denuclear, denuclearization. Can you explain the complications around that term and the fact that it means different things to different people? It means very different things to North Korea and to the United States. That's the phrase we use, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, instead of saying denuclearization of North Korea. There are no nukes in the South, so why do we stick to that strange formulation? Because to North Korea, denuclearization of the peninsula means dislodging the United States, U.S. extended nuclear deterrence from South Korea and Japan, getting the U.S. to downgrade and then ultimately abrogate the alliance between the U.S. and South Korea and with Japan. So get the U.S. out of the region so that North Korea would be better positioned to extort, bully, censor, have its way with that other Korean state, the South, which is far more legitimate, richer, freer. You think that this meeting on June 12th in Singapore is still going to take place. Tell me why. I think so because there are political victories, political gains to be had, to be made by both parties. Kim has far m much more to gain than Trump. But Trump can sell this as a political victory, even if Trump and Kim sign another faulty, open-handed agreement, which will just drag out the negotiation process without leading to actual resolution. Uh, that may even win the Nobel Peace Prize for President Trump, who knows, maybe for Kim Jong-un as well. So the optics will be gripping. It will be the top headline news all around the world. So I think the incentive to make this happen is there for both Trump and the North Korean dictator. But you think that it'll be more of a photo op than anything in terms of substan substantive change? There will be substantive gains for North Korea. In any drawn-out negotiations, there'll have to be some reciprocity, mutual concessions, and that means the U.S. will stop enforcing tough sanctions against North Korea, and that translates into Kim buying time and money with which to perfect his own nuclear posture review to go on advancing his menacing nuclear and missile capabilities, and that's what he seeks in doing this. All right, uh, Professor, thank you. That is uh, Sung Yoon Lee in Burlington, Massachusetts. He is a professor of Korean studies.